We have the first and so far the only literary district in the United States. And that's actually how it should be because American literature started right here in this country and in fact very near to Faneuil Hall. And today we have an incredible group of actors who are going to bring you, reenact for you, come to life uh, early American and some uh, more modern and contemporary American poets and orators who spoke either in or at Faneuil Hall or nearby in, in other Boston locations. The Poets Theater is an unbelievable group dedicated to the spoken word. It celebrates the power of distinctive language and poetry's unmatched ability to deliver a rich and meaningful cultural experience to its audience. Bob is gonna actually be your MC today. He's gonna to kick things off, tell you a little about the actors and how they're gonna be performing and what they're doing. So with that, I'd like to introduce Robert Scanlon. We're gonna be giving you today a sample of some of the things that have made this area that has been designated the literary district uh, a distinguished part of American history. And um, the selections that we have for you are examples of oratory, great oratory, some of it given right here in Faneuil Hall. And within a mile of where we are right now, every single person we've selected is going, has uh, spoken in Boston. Uh, I hope you enjoy the program. Stay as long or as short as time as you want. Uh, and um, we are now going to give you some examples of local oratory over the years. So the first piece we're going to be doing here, uh, that I will be doing here, is uh, is the Concord Hymn uh, by Ralph Waldo Emerson. This piece, uh, many people know the first uh, the first stanza of it, but not so many people have actually heard the whole thing in a long time. This piece was written by Emerson to uh, at the completion of the Battle Monument in Concord uh, on April 19, 1836. The Concord Hymn. By the rude bridge that arched the flood, their flag to April's breeze unfurled. Here once the embattled farmers stood and fired the shot heard round the world. The foe, long since in silence, slept. Alike the conqueror, silence sleeps. And time the ruined bridge has swept down the dark stream which seaward creeps. On this green bank, by this soft stream, we set today a votive stone that memory may their deed redeem when like our sires, our sons are gone. Spirit, that made those heroes dare to die and leave their children free. Bid time and nature gently spare the shaft we raise to them and thee. Thanks. As Bob said, the Boston Massacre took place steps away, and on the anniversary of that occasion, John Hancock gave the speech full of the uh, ever trendier anti-British rhetoric is John Hancock to it. But I forbear and come reluctantly to the transactions of that dismal night when in such quick succession we felt the extremes of grief, astonishment, and rage when heaven in anger for a dreadful moment suffered hell to take the reins. When Satan, with his chosen band, opened the sluices of New England's blood and sacrilegiously polluted our land with the dead bodies of her guiltless sons. Let this sad tale of death never be told without a tear. Let not the heaving bosom cease to burn with a manly indignation at the barbarous story through the long tracts of future time. Let every parent tell the shameful story to his listening children until tears of pity glisten in their eyes and boiling passions shake their tender frames. Tell me, ye bloody butchers, ye villains high and low, ye wretches who contrived, as well as you who executed the inhuman deed, do you not feel the goads and stings of conscious guilt pierce through your savage bosoms? 
Though some of you may think yourselves exalted to a height that bids defiance to human justice, and others shroud yourselves behind the mask of hypocrisy and build your hopes of safety on the low arts of cunning, chicanery, and falsehood, yet do you not sometimes feel the gnawings of that worm which never dies? You dark designing knaves, you murderers, parasites! How dare you tread upon the earth which has drunk in the blood of slaughtered innocents shed by your wicked hands? How dare you breathe that air which wafted to the ear of heaven the groans of those who fell a sacrifice to your accursed ambition? Yet hear it and tremble. The eye of heaven penetrates the darkest chambers of the soul, traces the leading clue through all the labyrinths which your industrious folly has devised. And you, however you may have screened yourselves from human eyes, must be arraigned, must lift your hands red with the blood of those whose death you have procured at the tremendous bar of God. I would not dwell too long upon the horrid effects which have already followed from quartering regular troops in this town. Let our misfortunes teach posterity to guard against such evils for the future. Surely you will never tamely suffer this country to be a den of thieves. Remember, my friends, from whom you spring. Let not a meanness of spirit, unknown to those who you boast of as your fathers, excite a thought to the dishonor of your mothers. I conjure you by all that is dear, by all that is honorable, by all that is sacred, not only that ye pray, but that ye act, that if necessary ye fight and even die for the prosperity of our Jerusalem. Break in sunder with noble disdain the bonds with which the Philistines have bound you. I have the most animating confidence that the present noble struggle for liberty will terminate gloriously for America. And let us play the man for our God and for the cities of our God while we are using the means in our power. Let us humbly commit our righteous cause to the great Lord of the universe who loveth righteousness and hateth iniquity. Uh, this is a speech or an excerpt from a speech that he delivered just across the water here at the Bunker Hill Monument on uh, June 17th, 1825. So Steve has just given you some of the passion that led to the actual revolution based on the outrage of the Boston Ma Massacre. This is 50 years later, and the Bunker Hill, the Battle of Bunker Hill was very soon after that speech about that rabble-rousing speech, in fact, inciting speech, to what was then treasonable rebellion uh, by John Hancock. Uh, but now it's a celebration of the laying of the cornerstone of that huge monolith that overlooks Charlestown, and from it, from the hill, uh, an enormous crowd assembled on the 50th anniversary of the Battle of Bunker Hill, and they were addressed by Daniel Webster. Uh, part of what I enjoy about these early speeches and the whole idea of public elocution as entertainment is the astonishing precision of their not only diction, but the construction of his sentences and sentiments as they were expressed. As I indicated earlier, this speech is about one and a half or two hours long, and apparently thousands of people were at the uh, location. And uh, here is how it begins, and I will read you just the beginning and the end. This uncounted multitude before me and around me proves the feeling which the cause has excited. These thousands of human faces glowing with sympathy and joy and from the impulses of a common gratitude turn reverently to heaven in this spacious temple of the firmament. Proclaim that the day, the place, and the purpose of our assembling have made a deep impression on all our hearts. If indeed there be anything in local association fit to affect the mind of man, we need not strive to repress the emotions 
which agitate us here. If our humble purpose had never been conceived, if we ourselves had never been born, the 17th of June, 1775, would have been a day on which all subsequent history would have poured its light. And the eminence where we stand at a point of attraction to the eyes of successive generations, um, we are and proclaim ourselves through this monument to be Americans. And now, let us indulge an honest exaltation in the conviction of the benefits which the example of our country has produced and is likely to produce on human freedom and human happiness. We who are assembled here can win no laurels in a war for independence. Earlier and worthier hands have gathered them all. Nor are these places for us, are there places for us by the side of Ceylon and Alfred and other founders of states. Our fathers have filled those places. But there remains to us a great duty of defense and preservation. And there is open to us also a noble pursuit to which the spirit of the time strongly invites, invites us. Our proper business is improvement. Let our age be the age of improvement. In a day of peace, let us advance the arts of peace and the works of peace. Let us develop the resources of our land, call forth its powers, build up its institutions, promote all its great interests, and see whether we also, in our day and generation, may not perform something worthy in its own right to be remembered. To uh, Frederick Douglass gave this speech commemorating Fourth of July, uh, and it was held at Rochester, so this speech was not given in Boston, but it, it's timely and meaningful. Fellow citizens, pardon me. Allow me to ask, why am I called upon to speak here today? What have I or those I represent to do with your national independence? Are the great principles of political freedom and of natural justice embodied in that Declaration of Independence extended to us? And am I therefore called upon to bring our humble offering to the national altar and to confess the benefits and express devout gratitude for the blessings resulting from your independence to us? What to God, both for your sakes and ours, that an affirmative answer could be truthfully returned to those questions? Then would my task be light and my burden easy and delightful? For who is there so cold that a nation's sympathy could not warm him? Who so obdurate and dead to the claims of gratitude that would not thankfully acknowledge such priceless benefits? Who so stolen and selfish that would not give his voice to swell the hallelujahs of a nation's jubilee when the chains of servitude had been torn from his lips? I am not that man, in a case that the dumb might eloquently speak and that the lame mean man leap as in a heart. But such is not the state of the case. I say it with a sad sense of the disparity between us. I'm not included within the pale of this glorious anniversary. Your high independence only reveals the immeasurable distance between us. The blessing in which you this day rejoice or not enjoy from common. The rich inheritance of justice, liberty, prosperity, and independence bequeathed by your fathers is it is shared by you, not by me. The sunlight that brought light and healing to you has brought stripes and death to me. This 4th of July is yours, not mine. You may rejoice. I must mourn. To drag a man in fetters into the grand illuminated temple of liberty and call upon him to join you in joyous anthems were inhuman, in mockery, and sacrilegious irony. Do you mean, citizens, to mock me by asking me to speak today? If so, there is a parallel to your conduct, and let me warn that that is dangerous to copy the example of nations whose crime, towering up to heaven, were thrown down by the breath of the Almighty, burying that nation is irreparable ruin. I can today take up the plaintive lament of appealed and woe-smitten people. 
By the rivers of Babylon, there we sat down. Yeah, we wept when we remembered Zion. We hanged our hearts upon the willows in the midst thereof. For there, they that carried us away captive required of us a song. And who, they who wasted us required of us mirth, saying, Sing us one of the songs of Zion. How can we sing the Lord's song in a strange land if I forget thee, O Jerusalem? Let my right hand forget her cunning. If I do not remember thee, let my tongue cleave to the roof of my mouth. What to the American slave is your 4th of July? I answer, a day that reveals to him more than all other days in the year the gross injustice and cruelty to which he is the constant victim. To him, your celebration is a shame. Your boasted liberty, an unholy license. Your national greatness, swelling vanity. Your sounds of rejoicing are empty and heartless. Your denunciation of tyrants, brass-fronted impudence. Your shouts of liberty and equality, hollow mockery. Your prayers enhance your sermons and thanksgivings with all your religious parade and solemnity are to him mere bombast, fraud, deception, impiety, and hypocrisy. A thin veil to cover up crimes which would disgrace a nation of savages. William Lloyd Garrison was an abolitionist. He hated slavery. He almost hated slavery as much as our friend Frederick Douglass. And on the 2nd of December, 1859, the very day that John Brown was put to death down in Virginia for rousing up a rebellion against slavery, William Lloyd Garrison, in the city of Boston, Massachusetts, said the following, I do not wish to think or speak or write with moderation. I'm in earnest. I will not equivocate, I will not excuse, I will not retreat a single inch, and I will be heard. God forbid that we should any longer continue accomplices to thieves and robbers, of men stealers and woman whippers. We must join together in the name of freedom. As for this union, where is it and what is it? In one half of it, no man can exercise freedom of speech or of the press. No man can utter the words of Washington or Jefferson or Patrick Henry except at the peril of his life. And northern men are everywhere hunted and driven from the south if they are supposed to cherish sentiments of freedom in their bosom. We are living under an awful despotism, that of a brutal slave oligarchy. And they threaten to leave us if we do not continue to do their evil work as we have hitherto done it and go down in the dust before them? Would to heaven they would go! It would not only be the, just be the paupers clearing out of town, would it not? But no, but no, they do not mean to go, these slaveholders. They mean to cling to you. They mean to subdue you. But will you be subdued? I tell you, our work is the dissolution of this slavery-cursed union. If we would have a fragment of our liberties left to us, surely between the free men who believe in exact justice and impartial liberty, and slaveholders who are for cleaning out all human rights at a blow, it is not possible there should be any union whatever. The slaveholder, with his hands dripping blood, will I make a compact with him? The man who plunders cradles, well, I say to him, oh, brother, let us walk together in unity. This man who, to gratify his lust or his anger, scourges women with the lash till the soil is red with her blood, will I say to him, oh, give me your hand. Let us form a glorious union. No, never, never. There could
can be no union between us. What union has freedom of slavery? By the dissolution of this union, we shall give the finishing blow to the slave system. And then God will make it possible for us to form a true, vital, enduring, all-embracing union from the Atlantic to the Pacific. One God to be worshipped, one Savior to be revered, one policy to be carried out, freedom everywhere for all people, without regard to complexion or race. The blessings of God resting upon us all. I want to see that glorious day. What is it that God requires of the South? To remove every root of bitterness, to allay every fear, to fill her borders with prosperity. But one simple act without violence and convulsion, without danger or hazard. It is this. Undo the heavy burdens, break every yoke, and let the oppressed go free! The speech I'm going to give to you now is a selection uh, of once more of Ralph Waldo Emerson. Uh, he gave this speech uh, at the, uh, the meeting for the relief of the family of John Brown. If you uh, recall, John Brown led a, a, an aborted slave revolt in, uh, in Harper's Ferry in, uh, in 1859, and he was condemned to death and hanged for it, but it was one of the principal uh, uh, acts that uh, brought on the Civil War a year later later. Uh, and so this was a speech for, this was done at the Tremont Temple here in Boston, uh, in an attempt to raise money for the family of John Brown, who was just about to be hanged. This is Emerson. A slightly different tone from the fire and brimstone of Garrison that you just heard. Mr. Chairman and fellow citizens, I share the sympathy and sorrow which have brought us together. This commanding event which has brought us together eclipses all others which have occurred for a long time in our history. And I am very glad to see that this sudden interest in the hero of Harper's Ferry has provoked an extreme curiosity in all parts of the Republic in regards to the details of his history. He was happily a representative of the American Republic. Captain John Brown is a farmer, the fifth in descent from Peter Brown, who came to Plymouth in the Mayflower in 1620. All the six have been farmers. His grandfather of Simsbury in Connecticut was a captain in the Revolution. He is a man to make friends wherever on earth courage and integrity are esteemed. The rarest of heroes, a pure idealist with no by ends of his own. Many of you have seen him and everyone who has heard him speak has been impressed alike by his simple artless goodness joined with his sublime courage. He joins that perfect Puritan faith which has brought his fifth ancestor to Plymouth Rock with his grandfather's ardor in the revolution. He believes in two articles, two instruments, shall I say? The Golden Rule and the Declaration of Independence. And he used this expression in conversation here concerning them. He said, better that a whole generation of men women and children should pass away by a violent death than that one word of either should be violated in this country. There is a unionist. There is a strict constructionist for you. He believes in the union of the states and he conceives that the only obstruction to the union is slavery. And for that reason, as a patriot, he works for its abolition. You remember his words. If I had interfered in behalf of the rich, the powerful, the intelligent, the so-called great, or any of their friends, parents, or wives, or children, it would have been all right. But I believe that to have interfered as I have done for the despised poor was not wrong, but right. Nothing can resist the sympathy which all elevated minds must feel with Brown, and through them the whole civilized world. And if he must suffer, he must drag official gentlemen into immortality most undesirable, of which they have already had some disagreeable forebodings. 
Indeed, it is the reductio ad absurdum of slavery when the governor of Virginia is forced to hang a man whom he declares to be a man of the most integrity, truthfulness, and courage he has ever met. Is that the kind of man the gallows is built for? It were bold to affirm that there is within that broad commonwealth at this moment another citizen as worthy to live and as deserving of all public and private honor as this poor prisoner. I said John Brown was an idealist. He believed in his ideas to that extent that he existed to put them into action. He said he did not believe in moral suasion. He believed in putting the thing through. He saw how deceptive the forms are. We fancy in Massachusetts that we are free. Yet it seems the government is quite unreliable. Great wealth, great population, men of talent in the executive, on the bench, all the forms seem right. And yet life and freedom are not safe. Why? Because the judges rely on the forms and do not, like John Brown, use their eyes to see the facts behind the forms. They assume that the United States can protect its witness or its prisoner. If judges cannot find law enough to maintain the sovereignty of the state and to protect the life and freedom of every inhabitant, not a criminal, it is idle to compliment them as learned and venerable. What avails their learning or veneration? At a pinch, they are no more use than idiots. And that little uh, thing on the judiciary, I think, in particular right now, has some salience. So, <laughs> all right, thank you. In the tradition of uh, writers like Emerson and Whitman, uh, Oliver Wendell Holmes Sr. wrote a poem which might be one of the most graceful meditations on spiritual progress for which we were hoping amidst all the inflammatory language and rhetoric there is also a, a goal of being willing to grow and if you've ever seen a nautilus shell on the beach cast out by the sea and meditated on the life of the creature that inhabited it and the, the beauty the colors and the mathematical precision of it you can hardly come up with a uh, as glorious a meditation as this upon it. The Chambered Nautilus. This is the ship of pearl which, poets feign, sails the unshadowed main, the venturous bark that flings on the sweet summer wind its purpled wings, in gulfs enchanted where the siren sings and coral reefs lie bare, where the cold sea maids rise to sun their streaming hair. Its webs of living gauze no more unfurl. Wrecked is the ship of pearl, and every chambered cell where its dim dreaming life was wont to dwell as the frail tenant shaped his growing shell before the lies revealed. Its irised ceiling rent, its sunless crypt unsealed. Year after year beheld the silent toil that spread his lustrous coil. Still, as the spiral grew, he left the past year's dwelling for the new. Stole with soft step its shining archway through, built up its idle door, stretched in his last found home, and knew the old no more. Thanks for the heavenly message brought by thee, child of the wandering sea, cast from her lap, forlorn. From thy dead lips a clearer note is born than ever Triton blew from reesed horn. While on mine ear it rings, through the deep caves of thought, I hear a voice that sings, build thee more stately mansions. O oh, my soul, as the swift seasons roll, leave thy low vaulted past. Let each new temple, nobler than the last, shut thee from heaven with a dome more vast, till thou at length art free, leaving thine outgrown shell by life's unresting sea. Oliver Wendell Holmes.
This is a speech by Ida B. Wells on the lynch laws in all its phases. 1893, it was given at Boston's Tremont Temple on February 13th. I am before the American people today through no inclination of my own, but because of a deep-seated conviction that the country at large does not know the extent to which lynch law prevails in parts of the Republic, nor the conditions which force into exile those who speak the truth. I cannot believe that the apathy and indifference which so largely obtains regarding mob rule is other than the result of ignorance of the true situation. And yet, the observing and thoughtful must know that in one section, at least, of our common country, a government of the people, by the people, and for the people, means a government by the mob, where the land of the free and the home of the brave means a land of lawlessness, murder, and outrage, and where liberty of speech means the license of might to destroy the business and drive from home those who exercise this privilege, contrary to the will of the mob. Repeated attacks on the life, liberty, and happiness of any citizen or class of citizens are attacks on distinctive American institutions. Such attacks, imperiling as they do the foundation of government, law and order, merit the thoughtful consideration of far-sighted Americans, not from a standpoint of sentiment, not even so much from a standpoint of injustice to a weak race, as from a desire to preserve our institutions. The race problem, or Negro question, as this has been called, has been omnipresent and all-pervading since long before the Afro-American was raised from the degradation of the slave to the dignity of a citizen. It has never been settled because the right methods have not been employed in the solution. It is the Banquo's ghost of politics, religion, and sociology, which will not down at the bidding of those who are tormented with its ubiquitous appearance on every occasion. Times without number, since invested with citizenship, the race has been indicted for ignorance, immorality, and general worthlessness, declared guilty and executed by its self-constituted judges. The operations of law do not depose, dispose of Negroes fast enough, and lynching bees have become the favorite pastime of the South. As excuse for the same, a new cry, as false as it is foul, is raised in an effort to blast race character. A cry which is proclaimed to the world that virtue and innocence are violated by Afro-Americans who must be killed like wild beasts to protect womanhood and childhood. Do you ask the remedy? A public sentiment strong against lawlessness must not be aroused. Every individual can contribute to this awakening. Every individual can contribute to this awakening when a sentiment against lynch law as strong, deep, and mighty as that roused by slavery prevails. I have no fear of the result. It should be already established as a fact and not as a theory that every human being must have a fair trial for his life and liberty, no matter what the charge against him. When a demand goes up from fearless and persistent reformers, from press and pulpit, from industrial and moral associations, that this shall be so, from Maine to Texas and from ocean to ocean, a way will be found to make it so. Public sentiment which shall denounce these crimes in season and out. Public sentiment which turns capital and immigration from a section given over to lawlessness. Public sentiment which insists on the punishment of criminals and lynchers by a law must be aroused. The voice of the people is the voice of God. I long with all the intensity of my soul for the garrison, Douglas, Summer, Whittier, and Phillips who shall rouse this nation to a demand that from Greenland's icy mountains to the coral reefs of the southern seas, mob rule shall be put down and equal and exact justice be accorded to every citizen of whatever race who finds a home within the borders of the land of the free and the home of the brave. Then no longer will our national hymn be sounding brass and a tinkling cymbal. 
every member of this great composite nation will be a living, harmonious illustration of the words and all can honestly and gladly join in singing my country tears of the sweet land of liberty of the I sing. Land where our fathers died, land of the pilgrim's pride, from every mountainside let freedom ring. Thank you. For those of you who just arrived, we are the Poets Theatre of Cambridge and Boston, one of the oldest existing theatre companies in the area, and we're offering some classic oratory from American history, spoken here in Boston or nearby. On the 11th of June, 1963, John Fitzgerald Kennedy gave the following address to the nation. My fellow citizens, we are confronted primarily with a moral issue. It is as old as the scriptures and as clear as the American Constitution. The heart of the question is whether all Americans are to be afforded equal rights and equal opportunities. Whether we are going to treat our fellow Americans as we want to be treated. If an American, because his skin is dark, cannot eat lunch in a restaurant open to the public. If he cannot send his children to the best public school available. If he cannot vote for the public officials who will represent him. If, in short, he cannot enjoy the full free life which all of us want, then who among us would be content to have the color of his skin changed and stand in his place? Who among us would then be content with the counsels of patience and delay? One hundred years of delay have passed since President Lincoln freed the slaves. And yet their heirs, the grandsons, are not fully free. They are not yet freed from the bonds of injustice. And this nation, for all its hopes and all its boasts, will not be fully free until all of its citizens are free. Now the time has come for this nation to fulfill its promise. The events in Birmingham and elsewhere have so increased the cries of equality that no city or state or legislative body can prudently choose to ignore them. We face, therefore, a moral crisis as a country and as a people. It cannot be met with repressive police action. It cannot be left to increase demonstrations in the street. It cannot be quieted by token moves or talk. It is time to act in the Congress, in your state and local legislatures, and above all, in our daily lives, my fellow Americans. This is a problem which faces us all in every city of the North as well as the South. Today there are Negroes unemployed two or three times as many compared to whites inadequate in education, moving into large cities, unable to find work. Young people, particularly out of work, without hope, denied equal rights, denied the opportunity to eat at a restaurant or a lunch counter or go to a movie theater, denied the right to a decent education, denied almost today the right to attend a state university, even though qualified. It seems to me that these are matters which concern us all, not merely presidents or congressmen or governors, but every citizen of the United States. We cannot say to 10% of the population that you can't have that right, that your children can't have a chance to develop whatever talents they have, that the only way they are to get their rights is to go into the streets and demonstrate. I think we owe them and we owe ourselves a better country than that. Therefore, I am asking for your help in making it easier for us to move ahead and to provide the kind of equality of treatment which we would want ourselves to give a chance for every child to be educated within the limits of his talent. We have a right to expect that the Negro community will be responsible and will uphold the law. 
but they have a right to expect that the law will be fair, that the Constitution will be colorblind, as Justice Harlan said at the turn of the century. This is what we are talking about. And this is a matter which concerns this country and what it stands for. And in meeting this challenge, I ask the support of all our citizens. The words of JFK from uh, 50 years ago, and of course, uh, Remarkable how they still resonate today as well. Uh, we are the Poets Theater. Uh, we're here thanks to the Literary District for the Literary Lunch, and we're giving you examples of uh, great oratory and poetry by Boston that was uh, performed or spoken here in Boston by great Boston speakers. Uh, we're going to finish up now with uh, the final selection. This is a poem uh, from one of our great local treasures, Richard Wilbur, uh, one of the greatest American poets still living, a ripe old age of 80-something or 90-something, uh, uh, Pulitzer Prize winner, great playwright, uh, and uh, one of the founders of the Poets' Theater back in its original days in 1950s, so one of us. And this is a poem that, uh, that uh, Richard Wilbur wrote in 1970. Uh, he was invited uh, by the students of Wesleyan University to write a poem supporting their strike. And he wrote this wonderful thing, which I think very well sums up what we have presented to you today in terms of uh, the, uh, the, social, uh, the social aspect, uh, the, uh, the responsibilities, uh, civic aspect of poetry and oratory uh, in our great country. So this is For the Student Strikers by Richard Wilbur. Go, talk with those who are rumored to be unlike you, and whom it is said you are so unlike. Stand on the stoops of their houses, and tell them why you are out on strike. It is not time for the rock, the bullet, the blunt slogan that fuddles the mind toward force. Let the new sound of our streets be the patient sound of our discourse. Doors will be shut in your faces, I do not doubt. Yet here and there, it may be, there will start much as the lights blink on in a block at evening, changes of heart. They are your houses. The people are not unlike you. Talk with them then, and let it be done, even for the gray wife of your nightmare sheriff and the guardsman's son. Thank you so much. Uh, happy Fourth of July, everyone. Uh, again, we're at the Poets Theater and uh, the Boston Literary District. Uh, we're really grateful to have you here with us. You can check out our website, Poets Theater, at poetstheater.org. We have a lot of great. Books. What's interesting is that he is making a judgment on how safe it is to be a Jew in France based upon things that are publicly said and being prosecuted, by the way. Being, the comedian is currently being prosecuted for hate speech. That's totally idiotic. You want these people to speak. You want to know who they are, and you want to know what the message is in case the message is directed to you.